Good evening. I'm Dick Meserve, the president of the Carnegie Institution, and I'd like to welcome you all to a capital science evening. The singer-songwriter James Taylor wrote in 2002 that music is true. An octave is a mathematical reality. So is a fifth. So is a major seventh chord. And I have the feeling that these have emotional meanings to us, not only because we're taught that a major seventh is warm and fuzzy and a diminished is sort of a threatening and dark, but also because they actually do have these meanings. It's almost like it's a language that's not a matter of our choosing. What James Taylor and many other musicians have understood is that music, unlike perhaps any other artistic human endeavor, is deeply and eloquently entwined with the world of mathematics. The philosophers of ancient Greece explained music solely in terms of numbers and proportions. Though the Greeks did not have a complete physical explanation for sound, for wavelengths and frequencies, they understood that they could alter the frequency of a note by changing the length of the string upon which a sound was made. By doing this, they determined that the notes of the musical scale reflect a series of ratios. To many Greeks, especially the followers of Pythagoras, the description of music as mathematics was nothing less than a reflection of the structure of the universe. The whole number ratios of pure musical intervals reflected the harmony that they considered to be the universe's guiding principle. As a result, the study of music remained closely bound by mathematical rules for centuries. As part of the quadrivium in medieval universities, music, along with arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy, formed the basis of an advanced liberal education. Music was often called number in motion. Not only philosophers, but also many musicians considered the two inseparable. The 15th century composer Guillaume Dufay wrote a motet based entirely on the geometrical proportions of the Santa Maria del Fiore Cathedral, also known as the Duomo, in Florence, Italy. Later Renaissance scholars, including Galileo's father, Vincenzo Galilei, saw a distinction between the Greeks' mathematical perfection of ratios and the emotional response to music as sung by a human voice and perceived by the human ear. These scholars shifted music from the philosophical to the practical, from the cosmic to the human. Yet while music was taken out of the purely mathematical realm, it was not possible to remove math from music. Not only do tempos and rhythms follow mathematical rules, but also mathematical models are commonly used in research on music theory. Many musical compositions are deeply infused with mathematical structure and mathematical patterns. In fact, math provides a unique way to explore many traditions in music, among them as our guest, Dr. Noam Elkies, will explain the long tradition of the musical canon. A canon is a musical form in which two or more voices or musical instruments play the same or related music but start at different times. All of us are familiar with the canon from singing Row, Row Your Boat and Frere Jacques in our childhood. Dr. Elkies is a number theorist and a mathematics professor at Harvard University with a deep affinity for music. He has been comfortable in both worlds since becoming fascinated by the fingering numbers in a beginner's piano book. He double majored in music and mathematics at Columbia University and graduated in 1985 at the age of 19. He then went on to earn his doctorate in mathematics from Harvard two years later. He has remained at Harvard ever since, becoming a full professor in 1993 at the age of 26, the youngest person ever granted tenure at Harvard. Dr. Elke's work on elliptic curves, lattices, and other aspects of the theory of numbers has been recognized by many prizes and awards, including a Presidential Young Investigator Award of the National Science Foundation in 1991, a Packard Fellowship also in 1991, the Prix Picot of the Collège de France in 1992. In 2004, 
His expository papers won the Mathematical Association of America's L.R. Ford Prize and the American Mathematical Society's L.L. Conant Prize. In addition to his work in mathematics, Dr. Elkies is an accomplished chess master, pianist, and composer. In 1996, he won the World Chess Solving Championship, and five years later, he earned the title of International Solving Grandmaster. His musical compositions include an opera staged in 1991 in the Brandenburg Concerto No. 7, first performed in 2004. Tonight, we are privileged and honored to host one of the world's premier mathematicians and musicians. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Noam Elkies. Thank you very much for this great introduction and, of course, for the invitation to uh, speak at this wonderful location and uh, event. Uh, <coughs> one correction, my opera was premiered in 99, not in 91. <laughs> but uh, besides that, uh <laughs> 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 that was the simplest kind of canon you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> Dr. Reserve's introduction also uh, gave a brief explanation of at least what a canon is. We will say some, quite a bit more about how they're made and what mathematics or at least mathematical thinking can uh, tell us about it. Uh, in case you have not heard the canon recently, here is one. It's not quite one of those you mentioned, although it's another very familiar one. It sounds something like Have you ever seen such a sight in your life as three blind mice? <laughs> well, thanks. But of course, the remarkable thing here is not that I'm humming one of the canonic voices and, and whistling the other. That's what uh, the kind of thing that David Letterman calls a stupid human trick. Uh, <laughs> the remarkable thing is that the two voices are singing the same tune, but at different times. So I started whistling this. And then the same tune was functioning both as the lead, if you will, the, the, the upper tune and the harmony. And it's a good thing I have a piano here because this canon, as some of you know who have sung it as kids or still sing it with your kids now, as some of you know, uh, it works not just as a two-part canon, with only two parts whistling or humming or whatever at once, or singing, you can do it in three parts. So part one, part two, part three, sorry, and part four. like this. It can be a canon in three or in four parts. And the amazing thing is that it actually makes sense musically. As we'll see, if you do that with a typical tune, you just get musical nonsense full of clashes and harmonic, uh, harmonic incongruities. And the question is, how does one go about constructing these canons? And perhaps also why and <laughs> uh, <coughs> to what effect? Uh, <coughs> canons go back as you mentioned, almost as back as, musical history, as, as Western music history, there is an example, Sumere Vikumenin, which is attested in England 750 years ago. Uh, and composers since then, from Guillaume Dufay up to you know, various other composers we hear, Shostakovich, many composers still living, write canons, uh, incorporate them in the music to various effects. Uh, <coughs> so it can have the high spirits of a chase, the 
the, the, re, the lead voice starts out, the other voice starts now at the same time and tries to catch up with him. There's a nice example from Mozart's very last piano sonata. You might have heard it. It uh, starts like this. Almost like a hunting team, in fact. And a bit later, he spins out the team into this... But he does it with both hands, and he doesn't just have the two hands play together. But more interesting, a lot more effective, is the left hand is just a fraction, just an eighth note, behind the right hand, so it's... Something like this, which is a lot more interesting and more effective. Uh, this kind of canon, you see, there is actually the award in that sometimes used to describe this kind of canon, the kacha, can this be seen? Yeah, I guess so. Which is basically, uh, it's related to our word catch, although it's, it actually means like a hunt, like the back voice is hunting after the front one. And you can see it has this high spirits of a you know, fun uh, way of playing around with, of, of playing with the musical, uh, <coughs> with, with the musical materials. It can also be, uh, it, <coughs> sorry. Um, it can also be something more of an amiable type of conversation. One voice is saying one thing, the other is literally echoing it. Let's see if I can get this to work here. Uh, that's Brahms. I'll get to Brahms in a minute. Uh, oh, here we go. So here's the beginning of Frank's uh, famous violin sonata, here for violin and piano. The very last movement starts something like this. And so forth. So you see it's this amiable conversation. The two parts are basically... They're not fighting with each other, chasing after another. They're sort of almost completing each other's sentences. Um, then there is uh, the kind of thing that, uh, <coughs> by the way, this canon goes on for a whole, for, uh, for almost a whole page of music, and then it comes back to, e to end the whole sonata. Okay, now I just have to stop this. Here we go. Sorry, one of the, one of the great uh, privileges of doing this that I can actually, of doing this talk here, is I have all of this wonderful audiovisual support. Thanks over there, Mike. But I am not used to working with all of this equipment, so I... <laughs> right. At any rate, so we had the example from Mozart, well, the initial example from uh, Three Blind Mice, this from Frank, and most people, when they think canons, they think Bach. And one, fa one standard place that a canon shows up in as a way to build up or create the climax of a fugue in a fugue, you might remember, like the very first fugue of the well tempered clavier in C major. There's a theme, we call it the subject, there's a theme. Each of the voices comes in with the subject, the others go off and do other things. This is a fugue in four parts, so there's one more voice coming. And then it goes on for a while, but so far each voice has been allowed to go through the whole team before the next one comes in. But then, we've, but then what often happens, and what happens in spades in this piece, is that there is what they call a stretto, which has this effect that one voice is barging in on the other before he can even you know, get the first half of the word out. So that's a stretto, this is a very elaborate one, but it's basically a sequence of canons. You see, it's a canon, but it keeps building up on itself like that. It generates a lot more tension and excitement than just having each voice patiently wait for the previous one to finish its thing. And canons, 
so far, all the examples that I've given have been very overt. The, comp the composer comes, uh, comes and tells you, here, I'm going to write a canon, listen up. <laughs> but it's not always that overt. The composer can hide the canon in the fabric of the piece, like happens at this point, a minute or so, into the Brahms last clarinet, second clarinet sonata. Wait a, wait a minute, that's violin again, sorry. <laughs> the clarinet sonata, I said. Uh, <laughs> here we are. and so forth. Where is the canon there? Well, the clarinet is doing one thing, and the piano is accompanying, and you can hear it's sort of a rhythmic canon. The piano is the same rhythm a bit behind, but if you listen closely just to the bass part, you see there is an exact canon hiding there, very close, just quarter apart between the solo clarinet line and the bass, the bottommost part of the piano. So it's creating a very, uh, very unified musical structure, but it's not hitting you over the head by saying, I'm a canon. Uh, <coughs> So why do composers, as I said, from Guillaume Dufay through uh, Shostakovich through the present, myself included, why do composers do this? Why do they, we, write canons? Well, in part because it's a challenge. As I hinted at the beginning, it's not easy to make such a thing. It's the reason that George Mallory gave for climbing Everest, Mount Everest, because it's there. Uh, and as a corollary, uh, in part, must be admitted, I guess, to show off in some sense. I have conquered this challenge. I've managed to climb this mountain or ride a three-part cannon or whatever. But uh, that can't be the whole reason. After all, people who show off don't then, people who do something to show off don't hide it. And here we've seen Brahms, who, you know, certainly can write cannons as well as anybody in the 19th century, uh, writing a very exact and interesting cannon and then proceeding to hide it in the fabric of this clarinet sonata. And a better, a better uh, reason is what I hinted at the beginning of introducing this, that uh, excerpt. It's a matter of economy of means. You are using the same musical material to generate both the tune and the harmony. So you're using the same uh, uh, very, a relatively small bit of musical material to generate an extended segment of music, uh, both the tune and harmony, both the figure and the ground. And as listeners, we often recognize this, whether explicitly or subconsciously. And if we speak metaphorically, as you already suggested we should, uh, of music as a kind of language, uh, of a piece of music telling a story, you know, the tunes are the characters of the story, and then uh, counterpoint in general, you have two different tunes going on at once, with two characters, you know, maybe having a conversation, except that this is the kind of conversation you can never have on stage or in real life where two people are talking at the same time, but you can hear it not as a clash, but as a sound that's greater than, as something that's greater than the sum of its parts. And a canon is a particularly interesting case of that where you have two different voices doing that, but they're seeing the same thing. So it's sort of a character having a conversation with itself, which instead of being schizophrenic in some sense is Actually, you know, you're sort of, there are different aspects of the tune's personality, the tune personality, the descant, the harmony, the middle voice, and they're interacting with each other. And so that is part of the kind of effect that a canon can have within all these various different musical settings of building up tension, having an amiable conversation, having this uh, reflective moment, or having a, you know, sort of a wild chase type thing. Uh, I'm not here so much to philosophize about why, uh, the, about, uh, you know, why these canons are in the music, as I've been sort of doing now, but to explore the what, what, you know, what they are, their construction, and also the how of how one actually goes about creating them. So besides just offering a sample of some of my favorite canons, I'll also let you in on how one starts to go about composing which you know, literally is putting together, how does one go about composing one of these canons? And there are different possible structures, some of which are 
you know, so difficult that we only have a couple of examples in literature, and others are relatively easy and you can actually make them in real time. So I'll show that I can actually improvise a can on the spot. We'll get there in a minute. Uh, to explain this, because after all I can't assume uh, even a knowledge of music notation, I will give, an, I will give a, a kind of notation for for, for these canons at a rather abstract level. So there's the beginning of a score of three blind mice. Um, and you can see there's lots of, rather, a lot of information there, even just for the first two parts, the six measures. But I've also given some markings, A, B, C, and then the second voice, A, B. And that's really all you need to know for like, what's happening as far as which parts of the canon go with which at any point of the music. A corresponds to these first two measures, three blind mice, three blind mice. B is the next two, see how they run, see how they run. And remember that because the canon, at the time B is going to go in voice one, voice number two is going to be singing or playing or humming or whatever, the three blind mice thing that we started with. And then when voice number two gets to B, Voice number one is already off to C. What the heck is C? Uh, they all run after the farmer's wife who, okay, never mind what the text says, it's a bit silly. Uh, <laughs> and of course, later on we'll see that, you know, this voice thinks C while this voice is doing D, and because it's around, we've reached the end of the tune with, the, so C is, D is, did you ever see such a, did you ever see such a sight in your life as three blind mice? And then, if people keep on singing it, they go back to A, three blind mice, and so forth. And so that's a two-part version of it. And then, if you sing it as a canon in three parts, there's a third part that enters there and things A when part one is off, has already reached C and part two is only at B. And then that goes on for a while. And of course, if there's a fourth part, then the fourth part is going to go, okay, let me just give you one more of these. The fourth part is of course going to enter here and because this is a repeating tune after A, B, C, D, we're back to A, there's no point in having a fifth part because the fifth part would just do the same thing as the first one but just enter four, four of these phrases later. Can you see all of this? No. Can you see it now? Maybe. Okay, that's better. So uh, that's a general kind of notation for one of these canons that is rather abstract, it throws out most of the musical information. You can't look at this and tell which, what music A, B, or C corresponds to, but it does tell you what goes with what. It tells you that A has to sound with B, and a while later B, C, and D, and A will all sound together, and at the next quantum of music, A will have moved to the top, D, C, and B will be here, and we'll have the same basic four snippets of music running together, but arrayed differently. And this works equally well for any other canon with the same structure. So here is Frère Jacques, which you did mention in your introduction. It has exactly the same structure as Three Blind Mice as far as this, uh, as far as this canonic construction goes. It's a very different, the score looks very different. It's shorter because there are fewer notes. Uh, the, the exact details of which notes correspond to A, B, and C, and D are different. So now A, instead of three blind mice, has become Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques. And then B is Dormez-vous, ta ti tam C is ta 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 D is ti ta ta pa 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 And then A is back to Frère Jacques. But if you know that, and you know this picture, that's enough to reconstruct the whole canon just knowing, this, just, just knowing this basic picture of a four-part repeating canon, or four parts round, as well as the specific choices used for A, B, C, and D here. And again, the question is going to be, how does one construct a tune that makes this work? Uh, this notation, of course, can also keep track of when canons have different structures. So for instance, if a canon starts in the same way, 
a four-part canon, but instead of repeating, go somewhere else. So maybe A, B, C, D, instead of A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, I go A, B, C, D, and don't keep going. Let's say E, F, G, etc. So now... That might be denoted by simply changing this A here and all the other A's that it was going to become in the lower voices to E, and then this becomes F, and that gives us the structure of a general four-part canon where the tune does not repeat itself and the voices enter at the same interval. So second voice enters exactly the same amount of time after the first, as that the third for the second, and the fourth for the third. And I must admit that what I just played for you now is an inferior version of a wonderful canon that, Bach, that Brahms, excuse me, wrote as part of his uh, Motet, Warum ist das nicht gegeben, uh, at any rate, uh, which actually have part three entering not one unit, but after the, first, after the second, but two, and then part four is at the same relation to three as one was to two, so it actually sounds like. And so forth. And only then does it repeat after you have gone to, well, whatever the 16th letter of the alphabet is. Uh, at any rate, so it can keep track of this, and you can see now that, for instance, unlike the previous canon, A has to go with B, it has to go with the combination of C and D, and it has to go with the combination of B, D, and E. And then B, besides having had to fit with A, will have to also go together with C, with A, D, and E together, and with C, E, and F. So that gives you a way of keeping track of the various constraints that a composer had in putting together such a canon. I didn't say this explicitly, but you read this more or less in the way that you'd read an actual musical score. So each one of these lines, each, each one of these horizontal lines is a single piece of, a single uh, player, a single voice. And what happens at the same vertical coordinate is happening at the same time. So for instance, if you read down this line, you see that at the first, second, third, fourth, fifth snippet of music, we have voice one playing E at the same time that two plays D, at the same time three plays B, and four plays A. So that's basically what this notation is. And if you know that, you already know the first thing and a half about ordinary music notation. Uh, if you saw the brochure for this, uh, for this talk, you saw, already saw one of my, well, versions of one of these diagrams. I can't find it here. Uh, why can I not find it here? It's the one thing I have that has color. Uh, um, does any of you know? <laughs> ah, here it is. Sorry about that. So this was, the brochure, this was in the brochure. This is from another Brahms canon. It's actually a wonderful five-part piece that in reality, it sounds something like this. It's for chorus. Uh, and again, I need to find my mouse. Three un unfound mice. Uh, sorry. Uh, here we go. Schaffe in mir Gott uh, by Brahms. This is from a recording that the Harvard Collegium made several years ago. And so you see that here, 
this is a canon, but it's what's known as an augmentation canon. The bottom part, there are all of these other neat canons happening through the piece, and it's wonderful to listen to all of these, all the voices mimicking the ti ta ta dum ti ta ta ti ta ta, and then going off on their own thing. But uh, at the, what underlies all of this is that you have the soprano part doing the whole tune in the bass, singing exactly the same thing all the way from beginning to end, not just the head motive but doing it twice as slow. So you see I, in my notation here, my little uh, caricature or whatever of a canon, this, has, this has, has to be in order by having the A be twice as long. And that tells you that, a twice of, that the B has to go together with the twice as long A, but also has to undergird C and D going at, half, at, at, uh, at twice speed. And what makes this canon particularly tricky is that the soprano part then goes back and repeats the same thing as the bass and the tune. So in fact, there is a pseudo fractal situation where this B has to fit in not just here, but also has to fit the second half of D, which also has to fit B going at half speed and also, well, you get the idea. Uh, <laughs> but Brahms had no time to just get the idea, but construct the whole thing and make it sound like a real piece of music, which of course he did superbly. Um, so uh, <coughs> that's this basic notation I'm using. Oh, my microphone is off. It thinks it's on. Okay, it's back on. Thanks. Uh, it's okay now? Oh, oh, I get it. It slipped down. Is that better? Ah, thank you. Okay, so that's the basic notation I'm using here. And if that feels more like algebra than like music, that's for good reason. It's we're using the letters basically as variables in much the same way as we'd be using algebra, except that instead of variables that stand for numbers, they're variables that stand for snippets of music. So like this A here stands for ti ta ta tom but in three blind mice it would stand for ti ta tom ti ta tom and in Fairy it stood for ti ta ti ta ti ta tom etc. And what this keeps track of is not not the specific choices of what A is, but what are the relations between two different ones of these variables. So like here B and A have to be in this kind of relationship, but in any four part canon it has the same structure as Fairy Jacket well, any two-part canon, let's say, it all ha the A, B, C, D all has to satisfy these relations. So, being a professional mathematician who's also spent quite a bit of time uh, working in various aspects of music, I am often asked the inevitable question, is there a relationship between mathematics, which I might for now represent by this intimidating integer symbol, and between music? <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> thanks, but the folks who are hissing in the background have a point there, and it has to be admitted that most of the relations that one, uh, that one runs across between mathematics and music don't go all that much deeper than this musical pun. Yes, there are some important exceptions, like musical intonation, which you referred to in the beginning in, in, in your introduction, like Musical, like mathematics of musical rhythms, but for the most part, it doesn't go all that deep. But there are a few cases, such as that one, and also such as the structure of canons, where a mathematical and a scientific way of thinking uh, can help us uh, understand somewhat better what's going on. So remember, our task is to understand what is it that the structure that makes this kind of and on work, and what we, we mean by work, well, another thing that this notation is intentionally hiding is, does it work for Guillaume Dufay? Does it work for Bartok? Does it work for Brahms? That can mean different things. It's assumed that we already know what it means for A, B, C, D, E, etc., to form a good tune, what composers, musicians in general sometimes talk about working horizontally because of the way music notation is written, so that corresponds to A, B, C, D, E being a viable tune, and also for it to work what we call vertically, so for B and A 
C and B, D and C in this basic two-part canon for those to form acceptable harmonies. And so uh, if we think about this as scientists, the first thing that we need to ask is, is there actually anything to explain? That is to say, we have to refute what scientists sometimes call the null hypothesis, which uh, I'm not going to be able to actually define what the null hypothesis is. It actually turns out to be quite hard to actually define a null hypothesis. But basically, a null hypothesis is that there is nothing to explain because anything works as a canon. So let me refute the null hypothesis for you. I'll do it with another tune that you all know. The alphabet song or Twinkle Twinkle other things in other languages. It's not usually sung as a canon, but if the null hypothesis were true, then I would be able to do it as a canon. So for instance, hmm. maybe, maybe the problem is that I waited too long for a second voice. This is, uh, clearly, there is, the, the tune is fine, but the vertical structure, it's not a canon. It sounds like my left hand doesn't know what my right hand is doing. Uh, <coughs> so I think that suffices to refute the null hypothesis. And there's a corollary that says, first of all, canons don't just happen. You have to compose them. And second, if you are a composer who wants to have a canon in your piece, make sure it works before writing anything else. Uh, <laughs> Bach surely didn't start out spinning a, spinning a uh, fugue exposition over, uh, over this theme, and then try to think, oh, maybe it works in canon also, and in that way, and in two other ways, etc. No, he had to work very hard to come up with this tune that would work in all of these canonic ways, and then build the fugue, the first fugue of the right Temple Clavier around that. Okay, so... Now that we have something to explain, let's think about it in a more mathematical fashion. And the first thing that mathematicians often do when looking at one of these complicated questions is try to look for trivial solutions, solutions that work automatically uh, without any special effort. And here is what I'm sure will agree, what I'm sure you'll agree is after what we heard in the beginning, oh, except for that, this might be the second most trivial can you can imagine. Okay, uh, why does this work? Well, to say that it works is to say that, first of all, A is an acceptable tune, which might be debatable, but it says also that A always works with itself in harmony. And that is almost an axiom of harmony. I didn't tell you what it means for, I, I couldn't tell you what it means because it depends on details of what the, what musical style we're working with. I didn't tell you what it means for X and Y to work with each other in harmony, but I mean, we, that doesn't stop us from constructing some notation for it. Maybe X tilde Y is something that mathematicians often do when we are at a loss for a more meaningful notation. Uh, <laughs> let's say X tilde Y means that X and Y harmonize. And then it's almost an axiom that for all X, x till the x. x harmonizes with itself. So in particular, taking x equals a, a harmonizes with itself, and this works fine as far as harmony work, as far as harmony goes. And of course, it works equally well by yet another axiom that I won't bore you by writing down if I make it a three-part canon or a four-part canon and so forth. Now, of course, the problem with this is that it's called a trivial solution for a reason uh, <coughs> that if I just interpret this as being just the note A repeated over and over again, yeah, it works in canon, but that's still not a very satisfying piece of music. Uh, however, one thing we learn in mathematics is that sometimes the trivial solutions are worth paying attention to and are not as trivial as they seem at first as we seem at first, excuse me. Part of the reason for that in the musical setting 
is that A doesn't just have to mean the note A. You remember, A in general stands for some musical snippet. You might think it won't be any more interesting if I... If I just use the beginning snippet of Frere Jacques, but musicians know other ways of interpreting A so as to allow some variety, but still to preserve this basic fact that any version of A goes with any other version. So for instance, A could be any notes of an A major chord. You already heard an example of that. Remember the Mozart canon? Starts. And then a B major chord, B minor chord. So each one of these snippets that just goes up and down a major chord, that has to work automatically because that's basically our trivial AAA canon. And again, Mozart had to make sure it worked when he started the piece. But anyhow, so that is one example. Another example, also with an A major chord that it happens, is the Shostakovich fugue in A major, which actually has this other fugue subject. And so, of course, when it comes back in stretto, the stretto works automatically. Sorry. matter what I play here, because anything I play on a major chord will make sense harmonically. Uh, only slightly less trivial is uh, <coughs> that A can stand for a repeating harmonic pattern. You have, instead of just a repeating single chord, it can be some sequence. You all know this canon, right? Etc. So, uh, of course, this is a rather extended sequence of chords, and it's usually played with more finesse than I've just been doing. Uh, let's give a what seems like a less promising example, but one that actually can be put to good use. Just repeating what musicians call one five one, and any tune that uh, works with this. work as a canon in however many parts you want, and you've already heard at least two such tunes. So that explains these basic canons we heard at the beginning, and in fact, that means, because they use the same progression, I can play them together. Uh, uh, the tune is even telling you where it comes from. One, five, one. And, of course, that also means if you're so inclined and have enough hands to play eight parts at the same time, you can actually have, you know, one group of people doing the four parts for a Jacques canon, another group of people doing the three blind mice canon at the same time and say that some grand double canon in eight parts, but it's just this. Uh, and so forth and so on. And that's basically just all a working out of this basic AAA scheme. And there's another uh, solution that's only a bit less trivial, there's another axiom that says, oh, I guess I should have used, uh, oh, I do have some transparency sheets here, so why don't I use transparency sheets which I can go over. So, here is another basic axiom which says, if A goes with B, If A goes with B, then usually B goes with A. These are not mathematical axioms. Hmm, I'm not clear that was an improvement. Maybe this pen will work better. Somewhat. Uh, if A goes with B, then B goes with A. Again, that's not a mathematical axiom because we're doing you know, an inexact science, but it's a good guess that if A harmonizes with B, then B will harmonize with A. 
So if this works, then so does this. And of course, so does this again. And so you have a canon where, again, just going A, B, A, B, A is not of much interest. But if these are expanded out into tunes, it might make some more sense. And likewise, in three parts, so if A works with B, works with C, then probably they work in any other order, such as this one. And there is a repeating canon. In three parts, you just have to make sure to solve this counterpoint problem of making three tunes that go together, and also which plausibly go A into B, B into C, C into A, and you have yourself a three-part canon, such as do, la, do, mi, fa, chim, fa, chim, Many of you have sung, or at least heard this. Eventually, there's a third part that comes in, and they go up and down in all the permutations. But that's basically how you construct such a canon. Just find one configuration, A, B, C, that works, and then permute it around. In fact, all of these kinds of more or less trivial solutions of the canonical construction problem are often known as rounds, basically because once all the voices have entered, once we have reached this point, uh, <coughs> basically nothing musically happens except that we hear the same configuration in a different orientation of the voices. But it's basically the same musical material over and over again. That's, by the way, yet another explanation of how the Feuerle Jacques or Friedland Mice rounds were constructed, because remember, they are repeating also. So once you get to this point, once you get here, whether or not they are all variants of the same harmony, once you get down to here, this is just a different arrangement of this, as is this, and so forth. And so again, it is basically around. We don't get any new material. And OK, so that accounts for one class of canons, but it does not account for all of them. Uh, so now, let us try to account for non-trivial canons. And non-trivial canons, if I'm going to start from the same place that I started initially with a four-part canon, that would be quite hard. And another thing we learn in mathematics is to work on the easier problems first. So what's the smallest value of n that's reasonable to try? OK, some people are saying 2. Some people are saying 1. I'm glad nobody said 0. Uh, <laughs> I guess the John Cage fans are stayed home. <laughs> You've just heard a zero-part canon. Uh, as, far as, as far as one-part canons, those are basically tunes. And tunes aren't trivial to write, but the challenge in writing a tune is not a challenge of counterpoint. It's just a challenge of writing a good tune. That's not easy, but we have to assume, in order to make this into a reasonable abstract question, that the basics of writing good tunes and the base of horizontal construction, the basics of vertical construction of counterpoint, we must assume that we know how to do that before we try to combine them and write canons. So n equals 1 and certainly 0 is too easy. Let's try n equals 2. And except for rounds, here is basically the way that every two-part canon in existence more or less has to be written. Remember, you cannot just start from your tune dot et dot e dot um, and write it another copy of it underneath as voice two and hope it will work as a canon. What you do instead is you write A, some initial <laughs> snippet of music, and before writing a note of B, you immediately write A where it goes in the second part because you know that's going to happen. <laughs> now, that tells you everything you need to know, well, almost everything you need to know about B, it has to continue A as a tune at the same time that it has to harmonize with B. Well, that's something we know how to do if we learn counterpoint. So for instance, what now? Well, before going on to C, I know what the second part will do. Sorry. Can't play music with a pen in my hand. 
Uh, at any rate, so we have reached this stage, and now phi has to continue B and harmonize with B. But again, that's basically the problem we already knew how to solve, having constructed B from A. So maybe A, A with B, B with C, notation scheme here, there were eight segments, and the last segment in the bottom voice wasn't quite the seventh segment of music. Uh, this is a version of the symbol we usually use to end a piece of music. It's satisfying for voices to come in one at a time. We don't usually want them to leave one at a time. We want everybody to end together. And so G is going to be the last thing that part two does. And even Bach usually allows himself the freedom of changing G a bit to make this a satisfying conclusion. Because it's hard to make both G, to make G a satisfying conclusion, and yet make it also satisfying to go on for a bit of music and make H, and make that a satisfying conclusion again. <laughs> so usually we allow ourselves to change G, the next to last thing, a bit when it becomes the support of the last, of the end of the canon. But that's basically how you construct a canon. And I'm not claiming that this little thing I just played for you is the best canon ever written. Of course it isn't, uh, but it is a sufficiently straightforward procedure that I could have made it up. Now I didn't make that canon up, and okay, so I'm going to make a canon up. Wait, how do you know I'm going to make it up and not just play at another canon I've written before? Well, one of you has to hum or sing or whistle or give me a few notes to start out with, so I can't use the canon I wrote before, but I have to start from some fresh challenge and then apply this algorithm to it. So one of this happily very large crowd of people must be sufficiently extroverted to, <laughs> <laughs> to propose an initial challenge. Anybody? Okay, I have pom pom pom, and you have? Okay, wait, so I have and one. Okay, I have two choices here. Um, I might be able to work both of them in at some point. Let's see. Uh, the, the other one will, will sound like this, right? Okay. <laughs> Extrovert enough to say that, but not extrovert enough to confirm I have the right note. Okay. Uh, Thanks. So, in fact, two-part canons, the basic kind of two-part canons, are, in some sense, easy enough to construct that you can make them up on the fly. Um, <coughs> now, so that's how a single tune can do double duty, both tune and harmony. Can one do triple duty or more? That is, say, triple canons or beyond that. Here's an example, remarkable example, of a three-part canon. There's a lot more to say about two-part canons, even just at the abstract level before putting in uh, the specific musical questions and techniques, but I've only so much time and there's some neat stuff to be done with three-part canons. So here's a really famous example. Nobody knows exactly by whom. It's at least 400 years old. The origins are mysterious, but it comes from a British source. They're singing Dona Nobis Pacem. It's better known as Non Nobis Domine. So, 
they're doing this performance practice where you don't hear the whole canon at once, you first just hear the tune, and then part two enters. constructed. Now what, what does the composer of this have to do? So this A here, okay, we know already you start with A, you write A here, you have to write B, then B goes here, you have to write C. Oh no, wait a minute, this C is going to have to go together with this A also. And once I write this A and C together, this D has to go together with them, but it will also have to go together with B. And then, of course, likewise, the E has to go with D and B, but also with C. And while you're doing that, you have to make some coherent musical shape out of, out of the tune. This is incredibly hard to do, and I can only think of like three or four examples of canons I've seen that have this structure. Almost every three-part canon writer, be it Dufay or Joscan or, oh, wait a minute, I actually have an eraser. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Almost any three-part canon writer, be it Shostakovich in the 20th century or, uh, or Joskan hundreds of years before Bach, makes sure that parts one and two of a three-part canon are in the same relation as parts two and three. Because, let us say that part three starts exactly at the same distance after two that two did after one, because that means that having constructed A and B, the next step, A and B are already given to us for free. And that means we only have to continue A and B so as to match with some existing two-part counterpoint, which is still not trivial, but it's something that composers learn to do. And of course, the same thing is going to be true, B and C matching with B, C and D matching with E, and so forth. And this kind of canon, I can't make up on the spot. For one thing, I only have two hands. For another thing, there's a matter of needing to have enough of a memory buffer to store what C is doing as you have to figure out D and also to try to have enough processing power to uh, try to make music out of it. But in principle, writing a three-part canon is the same kind of algorithm that we have seen for two parts. And likewise, for a four-part canon and so forth, although there aren't that many canons in four parts, let alone more, because, I mean, there are lots of rounds, but there is musical inertia that begins to set in. Like, if this is our typical pattern for a four-part canon that does not repeat, well, even if E doesn't repeat what A did, it has to go with B, C, and D, and B, C, and D already go with A, and usually, once you have one of these counterpoint tasks, you have three parts and you want to add a fourth one, or you have seven parts, you want to add an eighth one. If you already have one solution, it's pretty hard to find another one. So these canons usually do tend to either stop at three voices or become those uh, repeating canons that we call rounds. So that's what happens when you go to three parts and perhaps more. And in another direction, uh, <coughs> There's more to be said in, about two-part canons, not just because of structural reasons, but also because it's actually quite rare that you hear a, pu a pure two-part canon in a piece of music. There's only one voice singing A, B, C, D. There's another voice singing wait A, B, C, D, and nothing else. Uh, what usually happens, and we've already seen some examples of it, that there are two voices doing that, and there's a whole bunch of other interesting music happening at the same time. We saw this in the Brahms Sonata, where we actually had to listen for the bass part because there was all this other neat stuff happening. Happening above it. We saw it in the Frank Sonata. We saw it in the 
Bach in the Brahms uh, canon in five parts, where it was actually only the bottom and top parts in canon. Uh, again, one has to talk about Bach when talking about canons. The Goldberg variations famously have nine exact canons in them. There are 30 variations, nine of them are canons, but there are nine exact two-part canons, but only uh, one of them is just two voices. Uh, just that one of the canons. Almost all of the canons, let's say eight out of nine, actually have three parts. So in our little caricature or schematic diagram of a canon, okay, well I find the piece or I have to memorize it? No, here it is. So in almost all actual, or almost all of the Goldberg variations, there's a bass, and the bass isn't restricted to obeying any kind of canonic rule. Every once in a while it, you know, it copies a snippet of voice one or voice two, or introduces some other idea that they take over, but basically it's there just to make the structure more interesting. So here's, for instance, the 18th variation, the canon. It's fine as a canon, but it's so much more interesting and richer to have because of just the first half of the canon. Most composers do this simply because it's easier to write a canon with a gluing bass part that helps you know, smooth the rough spots between, of harmony between the two parts. Bach doesn't need any glue, but uh, his canons work just, you know, hold together just fine. But it still makes for a richer structure. And it also, remember, these are Goldberg variations. So there is also a hidden constraint here this has to be the same harmony that the tune started with, right? Uh, so that should somehow correspond, and it does harmonically to... And that can be a lot more convincing if you have a bass part to outline the harmony. So that's one way that a canon can become, you know, both musically richer, but also uh, somewhat easier to write or able to do some other things. Uh, <coughs> so, for lack of time, I'm not going to tell you much about augmentation canons and double canons, etc. I will, however, mention that there is sort of a dual to this, where instead of having some free third part, you have a pre-assigned third part. So that's actually not a bass. It's usually like a hymn tune. What often happens is what's called the chorale prelude. Bach likes to do this, where he'll take some standard you know, church tune, and he'll write a two-part canon that proceeds just fine. Every once in a while, he'll drop in a phrase of this hymn tune that phrase one of the tune, phrase two of the tune. Everybody knows it. So he couldn't have just written that hymn tune. Probably Martin Luther did it a few centuries before. And somehow this canon, besides just you know, following the algorithm and also sounding like music, has to somehow fit these pre-existing bits of music. And uh, of course, the real challenge is not to uh, just make it work, but to make it sound not like you're doing counterpoint, ex counterpoint exercises and uh, algorithms, but like you're actually you know, writing music and you're not fighting with the hymn tune, but you're like showing a new property of this character, this metaphorical character in the story that this canonical chorale player is writing. So I'll finish off with uh, what you might think of as either a uh, tribute or a parody of sorts of these canons. I'm going to play to finish off with playing my own chorale prelude, and it's on a hymn tune that, again, the question is how do you know that I'm really playing one of my own pieces and not just stealing <laughs> something that Bach or somebody you have never heard of but is not known Americans wrote before. Uh, the way you'll be sure it's not Bach is that even though it has the same structure as one of these canonic uh, chorale periods, it does not use a tune that Bach would ever have deigned to dignify 
by writing a, a canonic prelude to. It's a tune that we have heard already, and if you listen closely, you will uh, hear some of our other canonic variants arriving every once in a while. The tune is known in various things in different languages. In French, it's ah, vous dirigez, maman, but that's what Mozart throws variations on. I know it in Hebrew as parpar, the butterfly, and so this is the parpar prelude. And to conclude, I will actually play it. So here is a canon. Sorry, too high. There's a scene from the movie Amadeus uh -oh. <laughs> in which Soleri is playing a song for the Archduke, and Mozart sits down and repeats it and says, oh, that's not quite right. And he adjusts the tune to make it perfect. And I never thought I would see anything like that in real life. <laughs> and we just did. Thank you. Thank you very much again. We do have an opportunity for a few questions. There are uh, microphones in the middle of the aisles. And uh, let me invite, we have just a few minutes for it, but let me invite a few questions. Please. objective thing that it works if you flip it upside down. Okay, uh, invertible, uh, I haven't defined that term. That's basically this reflexive argument, uh, axiom I mentioned about A going with B, depending on whether B goes with A. Again, this is, can't be purely mathematical because it depends on what style you are working in. I mean, for Bartok, this is perfectly good counterpoint. <laughs> Yeah, 
have to be in the right frame of mind to like this kind of counterpoint, but it's, I mean, it, 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 you can imagine a consistent piece of music. It's from Microcosmos, the diary of a fly, so it's like this buzzing sound. Uh, but basically, the short answer is, it's not a matter, matter so much of a matter so much of math, but of music. Almost every, almost every pair of, uh, of tunes that works in one orientation works in the other way. Sorry. Uh, the one ma major exception for those of you who know music theory is that fifths don't like to be inverted. So basically, if you have fifths in your counterpoint, you have to be either you have to be very careful about what happens to them because these kinds of fifths, these fourths, excuse me, which is what happens in the inverted fifth, like to go down. So you can do that, but usually you have to be careful about fifths. Uh, the real trick for invertible counterpoint is when instead of A, you have A shifted by some, by some interval so that what has to go with B is not A, but A transposed. There's a famous example of that in the brahms haydn variations. <laughs> Just inverted would be, but what Barhaus actually does is invert and then transpose down a fifth. Etc. So, but again, these are all things that you can describe in some sense mathematically, but at some point you also have to know a bit about the details about what makes your particular style of music and counterpoint you know, what, what the, so to speak, the rules are, including when it's okay to break them. Uh, so, it's so mathematics, yes, you, subjective, it's partly subjective, it's partly a matter of practice, but subjective doesn't mean it's entirely up to you. I mean, it's, <laughs> uh, it, 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 mathematics gets you part of the way there, but you still have to, have to work at it. We have time for only two more questions. Sorry. Let me uh, invite a question here. Hi, I have a sort of a double question both of which, both of which segments, you can't get both of them. Both of which them segments the provide the opportunity for some collaboration. Yeah. The first one is, if you think of a canon yeah. as a, a transformation or a family of transformations on a string, yeah. um, you've looked at basically transformations, translations, That's in, right. in onset time. Yeah. And now in the questions, you've just mentioned also translations in pitch. That's right. And now there are lots of other sorts of transformations yeah. that one could apply. Um, but of all the canons that you could create doing this um, mm -hmm. at random, most of them wouldn't sound very good. And so you have to sort of post-multiply this by a, a, a group, a selection uh, operator, which determines which things sound good. Uh, no. If only it were that easy. What, you, what, ha what happens with a typical tune is that nothing sounds good. And in fact, there are a few tunes which are so cunningly constructed that no canon will sound good. That's right. Yeah. It's almost a set of measure zero that actually works. Now, what determines the structure of the group of filter functions that uh, select our harmonies um, allow us to make meaningful canonic pieces? Uh, and what is the range of first of the uh, transformations that one might apply that aren't simply translations? Okay, there are two questions there. First, I was, I was only able to hint, I already went over time, and I was only able to hint at some of the other transformations like <laughs> augmentation, where you play the same string, if you will, but double the length of right. each note, or reversal. Crab cannons. And those and are based, I mean, there are sometimes when you, you play the same intervals but widen, so instead of you play it's a very... Most of these transformations the human ear doesn't respond to. You can't actually detect most tunes backward. You can detect them upside down. I didn't give you that example yet, but uh, the Bartok example actually is upside down. So maybe if I was doing my ABC notation, the second part might start like this. Uh, <laughs> those are cans and inversion. Uh, there are various, some of the ideas that I wasn't able to get into is uh, various structures on teams that make it easy for you to make, easier to make canons, like sequences. Once you know this works, then this has to work automatically. So you already have three, long, three times longer canon as you were able to find more, find more or less by luck at first. Uh, but these are hard questions, and you know, this tells you some 
notion of how, of how you might be able to algorithmically construct them, but again, algorithms only get you so far into the structure, you still have to work and you know, use your ears. So <laughs> we don't know the entropy of music, for instance. So <laughs> Last question. Last question, sorry. Um, this might be a little off subject. Um, I was wondering about um, Where are you? when you were talking oh. about the, the idea of you know complementary, you know, making A go with B and yeah. B you know, and so on. I was thinking of colors. Colors often mm -hmm. come up in terms of music as well, and colors also have uh -huh. to be complementary. What are your feelings on that? Oh, you're the one who wears the pumpkin pie shirt. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, there's a whole. <laughs> How seasonally appropriate. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, okay, there's a whole matter of synesthesia, but that's very personal, you know, people who hear colors in response to. It's not, it's not the same kind of relation. It's certainly true that blue probably goes with blue, and if blue goes with orange, then orange goes with blue or not. Uh, I mean, either blue does go with orange, and orange goes with blue, or in your mind it doesn't. But uh, I haven't... I mean, it's an intriguing question, you know, to write canons of color instead of, mu instead of musical tunes or rhythms, but uh, I'm way out of my depth here. I mean, the, I mean if you have a, a notion where you can interpret this algebra, you can reinterpret this algebra in terms of colors, then I can give you an algorithm, but I don't know if that's at all meaningful or useful thing to do, so I'm sorry. <laughs> we have had a remarkable evening. Please join me in thanking Norm Elton. Thank you.